Good afternoon, my name is John Shafley and I'm the Chief Revenue Officer here at FIP. Welcome once again to the historic Kenton Theatre here in Henley-on-Thames and welcome back to the FIP World Congress and Digital Innovators Summit 2020. One of the themes of this event has been generating revenue directly from consumers and this last session of the day looks at growing customers for life and how there's a cultural shift to a test and learn approach and how this makes moves towards maximising LTV, lifetime value. Hosting these sessions will be James Henderson, Chief Executive Officer and Founder at Zephyr. He'll be joined by Julian Thorne, Thorn, sorry, Chief Content Consumer Officer. My thing's gone too fast. There we go. Sorry. Uh, Julian Thorne, Chief Customer Officer at Dennis Publishing and Deborah Brooksbank-Taylor, who is CTO and Programme Director at New Scientist. But before I welcome our guests, can I remind you to please ask questions so that you can interact with all of our guests. Don't miss the opportunity to ask anything you like by using the questions tab. Also, the virtual exhibition is now open and you can view it from the timeline. In there, you'll find details of all our exhibitors and all our sponsors, including Zephyr. So it's now time to start the session. So over to you, James. Thanks, John. Thanks. Well, absolutely delighted to join you all today. Um, as John said, I'm the founder and chief exec of uh, Zephyr. And in two short years, we've really transformed and disrupted the technology space for the media industry. And we're proud to work with some of the world's most forward-thinking organizations. And we're fundamentally changing how they build, test, and optimize their customer journeys. We work with global leaders such as Condé Nast, News Corporation, McClatchy, Tribune, The Daily Mail, Witch, Euromoney, The New York Post, and many, many more. But today, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Julian and eventually um, Debs, <laughs> Deborah Brooksman Taylor from uh, New Scientists, who will be um, joining shortly after some connectivity issues. Um, now, we're here today to talk about how you put customers at the center of your organization and also build customer relationships that last a lifetime. I've had the pleasure of working both with both of these guys and they have a huge amount of experience in this space. And they, like us at Zephyr, place great importance on the customer relationship. We control the customer journeys, but for us, really building a connected relationship with your consumer is the key element in your strategic success. Now, that's enough for me. No one's here to hear listen for me today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with Julian, because Deb isn't here. <laughs> um, but Julian, um, can you just give a bit of background to your role as uh, Chief Customer Officer at Dennis Publishing and a broad remit for, for what you do at the organisation? You're on mute, just so you know. Uh, I've been doing Zoom calls for months and months and months, and I still forget to unmute at a critical point. Uh, yeah, as James was saying, I'm, my name's Julian Thorne. I'm the Chief Customer Officer for Dennis Publishing, uh, and I'm responsible for our recurring revenues, um, almost exclusively driven by subscription revenues. Uh, so our subscription revenues for Dennis um, equate to around about two thirds of our total revenues. Uh, and that's in the UK and in the US. Great, thanks, Julian. And uh, Debs has just rejoined us. Debs, um, just fill us in, in terms of your role as CTO and program director, I mean, you know, that is a pretty meaty role. Um, tell us a bit about the scope of the role um, and, you know, the, the, the full remit within the organisation. Yeah, hi. Uh, I hope you can hear me, guys. Sorry, had a few, uh, ironically, technology difficulties uh, joining there. Um, yeah, so I'm CTO and Programme Director, which means essentially I take two sides of the role. There's the tech side and the delivery side. Um, it works quite well as a synergy. I work very closely with our SLT to shape the priorities of the business and shape our overall strategy and therefore you know, the program of work to deliver that and tech is a key enabler in that area. So um, that's how I, uh, you know, rationale it myself. It, it's a big, you know, it's a, it's a fairly wide remit, but um, yeah, we're pretty focused on what we want to get done. Great, well, let's get straight into it, Debs. So in terms of your customer-centric strategy, you guys are at the start of your journey. Um, it'd be great to just tell us a bit about where you are, what you're planning over the next few years, um, and we can get into a little bit around the, the strategic approach. Yeah, so we are, um, you know, we're at an interesting time. We are just starting 
work to really build out new customer journeys and new experiences. Um, that doesn't mean nothing's happened before this point. There's been a lot of focus on understanding who our customers are, what their behaviors are, how we better engage with them, you know, and ultimately deliver products that uh, meet their needs, you know, which at the end of the day will build that relationship um, and increase retention. So, but we're at the start of, um, I guess, our, our current journey um, where we are looking to sort of build out and iterate new customer journeys um, into our, yeah, our overall ecosystem. Um, that might be increasing our level of known data. So really drive, you know, New Scientist has great traffic numbers um, and growth. And we want to really understand that audience better and um, engage with that audience. And then we can deliver the New Scientist product set to those customers, the right products at the right time to those. We're pretty early on. We're just starting to stand up some tests in that area uh, where we can do data capture so that we can better engage with that audience. So you guys are taking quite an active approach to uh, taking this Tesla and iterate approach. We are. We are. What, what is the trigger that led to that? What, why, why do you feel that's the right approach for you? I, um, I guess there's a, there's a, there's, as usual, there's many things at play. So I've spent, because um, I'm quite old, I've spent uh, the last 20 years or so delivering you know, various projects and programs varying in size, scope, you know, some global in nature and some not. And I think they have their play, you know, a traditional or older approach of, of sort of project management and project delivery definitely has its place. But for me, where we are in New Scientist, you know, we're at a really pivotal point where we're standing up new products, we're working on improving our existing products. We want to build our customer data like everybody does. Um, we want to deliver the right products to the right customers at the right time. And for me, there is, there's no right answer to how we do that. Um, so it's important that we test things, we experiment, we look at what works, we fail quickly if, if we don't. So we are taking a test and learn approach, I guess for two reasons. One is so that we can see what works best for our customers but also it builds up that muscle internally to do this, to really experiment, try new things, see what's successful, and then pivot away from the things that are necessarily not giving the return that we want. Yeah, yeah. and what kind of time frame are you setting from expectations with your executive about how long this is gonna to take to execute? Uh, I would imagine that everybody um, has something in common and that your exec always want things as soon as possible. Um, so I think there is, um, you know, definitely there's work that we've done with our exec where, you know, we've built uh, a good trust. We've got a great working uh, team in our management team. We're kind of focused around a set of goals, both for Q, you know, we roadmap things. We have our priorities for Q4. We have our priorities and Hopper for 2021. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot to do as well. So everybody gets that there's a lot to do. Everybody understands that there is no kind of golden answer. And therefore, it takes time to kind of test and learn. I think the key thing that helps us in that is that we use, you know, we measure what we do. So everything that we do internally, we measure it and we learn from that to see where it, where it sends us next. You know, does it point to something that's working? Does it point to something that's not working? New markets, new, new products to try. Um, so, you know, there's an element of trust, um, I guess, working together, but also um, having a common goal, common purpose. We're all centered around the same thing, which is, yeah, in a, in a cheesy fashion is to serve our customers better and to grow new audience. Excellent. And, you know, obviously that journey that you're going on, Dennis Publishing have been through um, something similar over a number of years. Julian, in your intro there, you talked about what a large proportion of your revenue is subscription. So I'm going to ask you a two-part question, sorry. Um, so firstly, you feel your subscription business, how do you measure the success of that? What are the metrics that go into that? And then, what about all the other stuff? Like how do you link that in? How do you combine those things into a master metric? So, you know, the way that same subscriptions is at the heart of our business. It's a major contributor to our revenue. Um, 
for our subscriptions, you know, we have many metrics, many drivers. We are focused on building relationships with existing customers, which falls into retention, you know, reducing churn. And we're also looking to acquire new subscribers. So that's around understand, you know, that conversion of unknown to known gives us a, a pool of customers that we can then engage with and better understand. Um, the other stuff, if I think about the other stuff, I think about the other stuff that New Scientist does. So, you know, we have the mag and the website, but we have podcasts, newsletters, um, virtual events is a new area for us. Um, I guess kind of, um, you know, accelerated actually by the circumstances we find ourselves in with COVID. You know, we've switched to a virtual events model rather than physical. And actually that plays really well into both our new audience and subscriptions. So virtual events for us are a paid, um, you know, paid product. Um, but also we uh, are standing up virtual events for our subscribers as a, um, you know, to, to better engage with our existing customers. Um, and we had the first of those events last week with, um, you know, over 1100 subscribers turning up to, um, you know, get a, a yeah, basically a free virtual event uh, to engage with our reporters, which is, you know, it's a great thing for our subscribers to get that direct relationship with our reporters. And is that a free element of a subscription product or is it value add? Do you, do you, do you sell that on top? No, that is a free element. So that is a subscriber benefit. So it's a subscriber benefit. benefit. Did you, do you do any of these events further up in the funnel to actually inspire conversion to, to subscription? Yeah, our virtual events are twofold. So yeah, as I said, we ran the first virtual event for our subscribers last week. Um, and that was Emily Wilson, our editor, with a couple of the key reporters. So that was a um, subscriber benefit, free for subscribers to engage in that event. And it's also available on demand for the ones who couldn't make it. Um, from a point of view of, you know, higher up the funnel, new customers, virtual events is a great way for consumers to consume content in the way that they want. So it's, it's basically, it's another arm to new scientists. It's another product with which um, potential subscribers can engage with us and, and learn about new scientists and um, yeah, great content that we have. Fantastic, thanks Debs. So Julian, over to you. So in terms of how you measure your business, um, we talk about the, the, the element that's a subscriber business, you know, the recurring revenue, how, how do you measure it? And then secondly, layering on the, the other elements, the broader other range of revenue streams that Dennis is a business um, looks to deploy and, 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 you know, actually has made great, great moves in with, with services such as Nows. Yep, okay. Uh, so I think the title of this session was Building Customers for Life. So the way that we look at our subscription business is um, calculating how much lifetime value we're going to create from our marketing expenditure. So if we spend X, how much money we're going to make in the future. Calculation of um, future anticipated recurring revenue uh, as, as a proportion of how much we're spending to acquire that revenue. Um, but it's quite, lifetime value is a really powerful metric because it brings in many of the metrics that Deb's just mentioned actually Turn, um, the average revenue per user, uh, expansion revenue, so how much additional product you can sell, uh, as well as the efficiency of your marketing. Um, so by looking at the ratio of lifetime value over your customer acquisition costs, uh, that's, our, that's our key driver in terms of um, measuring our subscription business, because it brings all the elements together uh, in, into one one equation. Uh, so what, what we try and do is use that classic three to one ratio. So if I spend a hundred dollars, am I going to make three hundred dollars in repair and lifetime value uh, over the course of a set period of time? So what, what we look at, because we're owned by private equity, we're owned by Exponent, um, who are a great private equity company who understand the care revenues and are heart and soul what they do. Um, so what we try and do is ensure that we make our money back within a set time frame. So we give ourselves a period of time when we want to have a decent return on that marketing investment. Um, and how other revenues fit into that? Uh, so you mentioned NAS, which is a uh, demand gen lead gen business. Um, so if we can see that a known customer 
Um, and back to what Deb's saying about taking an anonymous to know. It's quite an important element within um, trying to value lifetime value. Uh, if we know that a known customer is generating us a certain amount of advertising revenue, uh, for example, from demand gen market or simply from programmatic, we can build that into the lifetime value of that customer. It's less um, predictable, uh, as we all know, especially now, uh, than direct consumer revenues and recurring revenues, but nevertheless, it is an element uh, and an important element. Uh, so we call that expansion revenue. We call that a way of expanding um, the value of the customer. And what we've noticed, and we see this in other recurring revenue models as well, is that expansion revenue tends to be uh, closely correlated with high retention. So if someone's attending uh, either a free conference such as the one Deb's mentioned or a paid one or someone bought a print one shot or someone's downloaded a PDF. Uh, all those pieces of interaction with the brand, the more of those you have, the higher the retention tends to be. So you get a lovely double whammy. You get increased revenue, also increased retention, which obviously drives higher lifetime value. So as long as you've got the right products, right? Again, back to what Deb was saying, understanding what uh, customers want uh, and creating products that meet their needs, uh, not just products that you want to make because someone in your organization has got a particularly great idea that their mum also thought was a really good idea. It's whether or not the customers think it's a good idea is really quite important. So that's interesting. So you've been able to, by having a deeper understanding of the relationship with the customer, <laughs> who having a subscription recurring relationship, you can clearly append what you call expansion revenue to that individual user. So that then increases the potential lifetime yield from that individual customer. And therefore that then leads to a calculation on what your acquisition budget can be in your marketing budget. So you can reverse engineer back up to what you spend in your funnel to deliver the customer through. That's, that's essentially the benefit of this connected relationship. I'm really interested then, how, what, what do you see differences in value across physical kind of re revenue streams versus the digital streams? Like how, how do you track that? How do you understand that? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, um, it's a bit simplistic to say, you know, a dollar that someone pays you for a print product is worth the same as a dollar that someone pays you for a digital product. Uh, clearly a dollar is a dollar a dollar. Um, but I think in the, in the markets we operate in, um, a dollar of digital revenue is worth more to a potential buyer than a dollar of print revenue um, because the world is going one way and one way only. Um, so digital dollars are worth more in terms of future value than print dollars. Um, but they're also worth more because typically they leave a bigger footprint to allow you to understand what the customer is interested. Um, it's a cliche, but if a print magazine goes for a front door, you've literally got no knowledge about how that magazine's used. And I'm old enough to remember the world of controlled circulation magazines. Uh, I remember one particular customer, I remember what the publisher was called, but appeared to subscribe to every single one of their controlled circulation magazines and chemicals and data tunnels and tunneling. Turned out he was using the magazines to uh, burn in his generator to generate electricity. Right? So he was highly engaged with the products in a sense. Uh, but the point is, didn't really know what's happening with a print product. Um, often the print product actually is remarkably engaging. Um, but you don't know that on the individual level. Whereas with a digital uh, sign on or a known customer behavior, uh, there's a lot more clearly a lot more data available to you uh, and a far bigger insight into how that customer is behaving. Whether it be, you know, they always look at their emails or their email newsletter in the morning or they always look at it in the evening. So they're looking at it in the evening. Do we build social media experiences around that time of day? How do we do that? You know, it's got far more insight. As long as, obviously, it's all uh, completely GDPR compliant. This direct attribution to potentially the value that that individual is seeing in the product that you're delivering to them. So, yeah. and, and if you layer that onto 
what are these golden metrics around lifetime value and you're able to do some form of segmentation, how might that allow you practically then to build a test learner to race strategy? What, what, what might those steps be? Well, you look for correlations in the data. Um, I always find it really tricky to find the difference between cause and correlation. When you look for correlations and build around those and then test against that. So for example, you might uh, see that if someone's opening a email newsletter, they've got a higher propensity to renew their subscription, print or digital. So you might see that correlation. Um, and then you might build a test to prove that or otherwise um, by uh, simply not offering the email newsletter to it. seeing what happens. What you can't do is just say no one who, no one who Look to the email newsletter, the renewal rate is lower. That's just a correlation, not a cause. Um, so, getting really clear about um, what you're, why you're testing something. So, what you're going to do with the end result. There's been so many tests that have been designed where nothing was going to ever change, regardless of the result, other than an interesting conversation in a, in a meeting or an interesting conversation down the pub. Nothing's going to change. So unless you're running a test where you genuinely are going to at least conceive of changing your behaviours based on the test, don't do it. There's no point. Um, I've, I've, I've genuinely, I've seen people run tests to, to win a pub argument. <laughs> What's the point of that? Um, so, you know, make sure you're doing tests that uh, are valid um, in terms of the outcome. Um, and make sure that the outcome, if you do is worth it, you know, is it, is it worth any money to you? Um, so they're, they're two, a couple of things about tests, you know, test the big things uh, that are gonna make a material difference if you get a result um, one way or the other. Apart from anything else, it motivates people. And it's fun. Yeah, well, and it's nice to, you know, understand they're not burning copies of your magazine. <laughs> uh, but but so, so, so typically, what, what does a framework look like that for that? How long might you test? How many tests might you, might you actually start to deploy? If you're looking at, I mean, you know, that question's a bit like, like hell on a piece of string. But if you're, if you're looking at a test, say, to understand what's going on in a payment funnel, you can do a very quick multivariant test on should it be a red button, should it be a green button? Uh, you know, should, should we put this field here or that field there? Uh, and depending on your ability to validate your results statistically, you'll get a result pretty quickly and can adjust your payment funnel and make potentially quite a material difference to your conversion rate. Right? That, that'd be fantastic. Then you might do another test, which is far more long term which might be, okay, if we did, uh, let's take an example, if we offered a 50% discount to subscribers to attend a virtual uh, show, um, is that worth it to us in terms of reducing the yields from that customer? Because it, it yields higher engagement and therefore is going to drive our retention. You might run that test over a year. You know? So again, working out what it is you're testing and why and what the benefit is. Um, and in that second example, you might run it for a year because that's an annual conference. Right? So the following year, you go, not a 50%, 25% discount. Or you might say 75% discount, you might take three. Right? You're trying to work out what the outcome's gonna be against the objective that you wanna deliver. So in that second example, the objective would be to uh, increase lifetime value through higher retention. Does that make sense? Whereas the first example, the objective might be, let's get as many people through the funnel as we possibly can, because that drives down my marketing costs, which equally improves my lifetime value. So you look at these things like a flywheel, where actually one test actually can trigger benefit in the next test. Yeah. But these things can be a bit of a mind maze, right? I mean, even just what you've outlined there can be quite complicated. I'd be interested, because obviously you guys are both in slightly different sizes of organisations, I'm just kind of interested in if you determine that you want to go in this direction, you determine that you want to use data to build relationships, you want to build, test, and optimize the relationship, how do you get your team in terms of developing them, maybe changing them, evolving them, and then creating a process that they can work with it? 
What does that kind of cultural shift look like? Debs, I'm going to throw that over to you first, and then I'll come back to you, Julian. Debs, what does it look like? Because you've got a team, you know, I don't know if you want to go into the numbers, but you've got, you know, size of an editorial function, but not as many people in the business function. How are you going to do that within your organisation? Yeah, I won't talk specific numbers, but yeah, we, we, you know, we're a fairly small team. We're pretty lean, um, um, and we have a lot, a lot to do. Um, both from, you know, improving current products. We, you know, we want to crawl over the data to look for insights, to look for things that give us, you know, the direction to go in. Such as, as Julian was just saying, we want to stand up new products. We want to try and get into new markets. There's so much that we, you know, that we want to do. Um, and, and yeah, we're, we're a fairly small team. So for us, it's around, I, I guess there's a couple of things at play and, and they're, they, you know, they're, pre, they're pretty common sense, I suppose, is, um, you know, we, we build mini cross-functional teams to do that. So it's not kind of techies over here doing something that they'll then deliver to the business or the business kind of put in a set of requirements and then, you know, sit and wait for a month for something to be delivered. We are focusing on even though you know we're pretty small we make sure we've got a cross-functional team working on it because everybody's got their, their you know to state the obvious they're different areas of expertise that they bring to it um the business are really close to the outcomes that they want to drive you know there's nobody who knows all the areas of data that julian's just spoken to you know better than our marketing team so they have to be involved kind of in the process throughout tech are enablers you know to make sure that we configure things in the right way and i think a really key thing for me is then making sure that we understand the data we want to look at and um, what insight that will give us and then what you know what action does that trigger does that give us something you know does that inform us about something that then helps to shape a future idea or does it trigger a different test um so you know it's it, it's not highly scientific, I'm afraid. It's just around bringing kind of mini um, cross-functional teams together, well, you know, to, to work on an outcome and, and, and work iteratively together. I think um, we're definitely going through a cultural, I don't know if I call it a shift, but a cultural piece in New Scientist where that is being done. Um, and those teams are working together and learning together and iterating together. Um, and sometimes, you know, that's a little frustrating because we don't always have the answer to hand. We've got to solution things as we go. Um, but again, that, that helps to build a culture of doing this again and again and again. So we'll, we'll keep, you know, as well as testing and learning around our customers, we'll keep testing and learning on our approach as well. And we'll get better the more that we do it. Hey, testing on the business as well as your consumers. I, I think testing you... and learning everything. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, one of the interesting things is you've already moved one barrier, right? Because one of the things you're talking about is focus on outcomes, not output. And of course, a, a traditional product structure is very much focused around delivering outputs. Whereas mm -hmm. a cross-functional kind of squad functions like that are very much about the outcome. And of course, what that then means is you can be focused on the problem state for, for your customers. It's a, you know, that, that in itself is a massive mind shift. Uh, Julian, obviously, you know, in terms of how you're doing that as Dennis, I mean, like, does some of those things chime with you? You know, what are your experiences about the, the kind of people and process, the kind of cultural shift that you had to, had to exert? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd echo the cultural thing. Um, I think uh, so, sometimes people look at testing, even learning, <laughs> as sort of optional. You know, if times get tough, yeah, just scrap the uh, training budget. That's a bit of a classic, isn't it? Uh, and if they get really tough, don't do testing because um, it's time consuming. Um, I think testing is, I, I view it as an insurance policy because if you don't test, you never learn. And if you don't learn, life changes and the stuff that used to work doesn't work anymore. Because um, marketing, marketing that worked a year ago might not work today. And guarantee it won't work in the four or five years in the future. I'm talking tactical, which is not not the core tenet of the market, and they always remain the same because they're related to human behaviour. But the tactical application of marketing always test, always test, um, because you never know when the stuff that works today will stop working. And in my experience, which is increasingly quite long, um, 
when things stop working, they tend to stop working overnight. Suddenly, what happened there? It just stopped. And if, if you haven't been testing in the background, you haven't got a plan B. So you really, you, testing is insurance. And like insurance, you have to put a budget towards it. So you have to actually allocate cash, to some extent time, um, to, to ensure that you're constantly testing. Um, because by definition, testing most of the time won't work. So it costs you money and it won't work. But occasionally it will work and it'll make you a lot of money. So you need to, you need to budget for that. Uh, and culturally, you know, the way I found it works really well uh, is to literally allocate money. And then if it's not spent, if the test budget is not spent, it tells you a lot about your marketing team. It tells you either they're incredibly overstretched or two, they're very unimaginative. <laughs> but it's not a positive thing. If the test budget is not spent, it's not a positive thing. So it's, it's always got to be got to be spent because that's, as I say, your insurance. Um, but the cultural thing is, is, is essential. And the cultural thing, you know, relates to what I've just said, but also to accepting that a lot of the time it won't work. You know, failure is part of testing. It's almost, you know, it's, it's clearly axiomatic. It's got to be uh, part of testing. And, and people have to understand and accept that as long as you learn from your failures, you're always learning. So, and that's culturally, that's in some organisations, that's difficult. You know, people to accept that no, no one does a test thinking it's going to fail, right? No one goes, oh, let's do this, it's bound to fail. But you've got to understand that it will in the majority of the time. Um, and that's got to be culturally acceptable. Um, and related to that, increasingly in, uh, in the digital world, making sure that you've got really good, robust, operational tests applied. So you don't get a situation where you look at the result and someone goes, yeah, but yeah, I'm sure that's not valid. Uh, or that, you know, that tagging wasn't accurate. Um, or you just didn't, you didn't expose that to a big enough audience. Well, actually, the audience you exposed it to wasn't comparable to the test audience. You've got to make sure you've got a really, really robust matrix and good technology to, to understand that. Um, but if you don't, the test result will be invalidated culturally. Because I don't trust it. And then what's the point of that? So you've got to make sure that you've, um, you've got really good technical uh, infrastructure in place to make sure that the test result is not, um, not debated. Well, obviously, my aim is to say that the technology needs to be incredible to support these things. But um, I, I do just want to double click on a little bit there. So, so what you're saying basically is you're going to have to get the team to understand they're stepping into a big black hole that they uh, more than likely a load of stuff's going to fail. It's going to be really hard, and there's going to be some disagreements about some of the data stuff. So you have to get alignment up front. So. In that context, because that sounds really hard, um, what are the like, leading, lagging indicators, what KPIs can you stretch across that um, to bridge that divide? Because obviously what we're talking about there is a, an expectation delta that may be substantial. Yeah, I hope it didn't come across quite that negative. <laughs> <laughs> I apologise if it did. Um, no, the, the, conversely, the result of really good testing is it's really good fun. It's genuinely good fun, right? Because you're coming up with new ideas, testing the hypotheses out. And when you get the result, a lot of the time you, you get the result you didn't expect, which is not only a little bit humbling, uh, but also the results, um, you know, a lot of the time your boss is proved to be wrong, which is quite nice. Right? And we can't argue with it. <laughs> There's the number. Uh, sometimes you're proven to be right. It's just good fun. It should be good fun because it's, it's imaginative uh, because you've got to think of the hypotheses. It's logical because you've got to see what the, um, the outcome might be and whether or not that's commercially valid. And it's technically increasingly quite complex, right? So it needs, as Ev was saying, it needs good cross-functional cross things to test together. And again, that's actually good fun. When you get a nice cross-functional team working together on a common problem, you get a good diversity of opinion and view, uh, and that's actually really good fun. You know, that's, that's good teamwork. And uh, especially, you know, in the remote working that we're all currently involved in, that, in a sense of team, 
um, around uh, a, a testing culture is, is a very positive thing. Well, and I promise to the audience we didn't pre-plan that, uh, that both of these very knowledgeable people agree in that, but, but there does seem some conformity there. Um, so I'm going to split across now and ask you a couple of questions, and this is some like rapid kind of takeaways for our audience. So, um, Deb, I'm going to start with you. Um, what three tips, if you say three actionable things that our audience can take away to, to build a more customer-centric approach? build a, an approach into this black unknown hole that Jimmy is talking about, but there's this test and learn approach to, to reach success, to get to understand your audience better and build a better business. What three tips would you give us? Um, well, I don't know if I've got three, but I think, you know, I think really being focused around an outcome and getting a common understanding around that. So, you know, on a, on a particular kind of, um, you know, be call it we call it a project or an experiment at the moment you know we have marketing in the room we have tech in the room we have data and insight in the room and everybody brings their different skills and as julian said dif difference of opinion different ideas um that makes it really it does make it fun julian's absolutely right we're not all sat in black holes feeling depressed that nothing's working <laughs> so we're all doing it for a reason so but keeping your out, I think keeping your outcomes clear, and, and to me, you know, I bang on about it all the time, it's keeping outcome for customer clear as well. Um, so that we don't just kind of get hidden within our own, um, you know, functions or businesses and, and tied up in numbers. It's keeping the, the customer there. Another big thing, you know, I've said it already, it's that it's learning as you go. You know, failure is not necessarily failure. As Julian said, you always will learn something from it. And quite often, I think a failed test will actually lead you to another test, another area you want to, to go at. So there's no, there is no bad test, really. You're always going to learn from it. Um, and actually, I think the final one is going to sound a little bit, um, you know, corny, but I think particular, particularly in the environment we now found ourselves in, where we're all, you know, speaking from our garages, offices, lofts, you know, we're missing out on all those coffee conversations. The more that we get around things that are quite interesting, innovative, have an impact on customer, we can look at, measure, keep changing, iterating. Um, you know, I'm with Julian on this. It makes it exciting. It's, it, it makes it a good, you know, it makes your job worthwhile. It makes it, it good. It, it keeps you engaged and, um, you know, all that good stuff, which um, I think at the moment and probably without predicting for a while now, that's going to be really important. Yeah, and well, and you know, I've seen firsthand, I mean, you can see the enthusiasm that Julian was talking about now. I mean, we've, you know, we've seen quite closely the effectiveness of that approach and actually how cohesive it's been. Because, like, they've taken a really pretty, pretty and praise of amazing approach to this and, and have driven some really fantastic results. So, so Julian, I'll hand over to you. Um, you know, obviously, um, well, what three approaches would you say are like, actionable things that, that our audience can take away? Yeah, I, I, I appreciate what Bebs has just said there about the customer thing. I think the <clears throat> if you're a customer-centric organisation, by definition, you're thinking customer. It's really, it's it's hard to do because you've got to empathise. Really, uh, <clears throat> you've got to empathise with the customer. And one one of the things I think marketers generally find, well, human beings generally find difficult, is it's really hard to empathise with a group. You can only empathise with an individual. You know, it's really hard to walk in a thousand people shoes, but it's a lot easier to walk in one person shoes. I sound ridiculous, but you know what I mean. Um, so I think when, when it comes to testing, I, I often uh, say to my team, so well, let's come up with a hypothesis about a customer. Um, and let's be, if that hypothesis is correct, will it allow us to serve them better and ultimately make more money? And by doing that, in exchange for those in the book. So that allows you to understand what the outcome's likely to be, back to your point, a commercial outcome, but it puts the customer at the heart of the decision rather than just the metrics. It's really easy to just go, oh, what we want to do is push churn up by 2%. Well, yeah, who doesn't, right? But then, then you've got to work out, you know, what is the hypotheses that might help you do that? And you can look at your own data and decide, you know, well, this data is simply that, you could turn rate 
uh, our retention rate up by 2% why I don't know, pushing everyone on to continuous credit cards. Um, but where where's the value for the customer in doing that? Uh, what hypotheses do we need to come up with? Uh, and then you can build a test around that. So it's, I think testing can, if you're not careful, become a little bit abstract. And I'm putting back to Debbie's point. You think about the customer first and the hypotheses you want to build. Then can you prove that or otherwise in the test? Does that make sense, James? <laughs> you know, and I think this, this commonality of an outcome, focusing on outcome, working out what the mutual value is, right? Because, you know, yeah, it's all well and good thinking about things from a business perspective, but you to deliver value to the customer. This is a world of abundance. They can go anywhere to go and get a lot of great content. And if you want to engage them, you have to deliver that value back. So I think that's incredibly important. Great. <laughs> right, well, look, here's what I'm going to do. Um, John, um, I'm going back to you. You may have some Q&A. Um, what's the best thing for us to do? Would it be for us to go on mute and then you can answer the question? No, no, it's fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. No, no, no. You're fine. You're fine to stay on. This is a really, really fascinating conversation. And one of the reasons why it's really, really fascinating, which, which you two won't know, but James does, is that we're, in, we're embarking on this journey ourselves with, with Zephyr. And, uh, you know, you talk about teams and marketing teams and devs, you talked about having quite a small team. Well, we've got a really, really small team. So, you know, we, we, we don't have any of that sort of resource. So I guess um, probably to Julian and Des, from, from our point of view, I think that our starting point is to keep really, really simple and have sort of literally one or two outcomes and then build that journey out when we decide, you know, we've got to decide what we want, I guess, which we're sort of, we're in the process of doing now. Would you, would you suggest? say that was the right approach do you want to go first julian yep yeah i don't mind uh, <laughs> do you go first next time then? Sure. All right. oh no <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah no i think john yeah working out what what you want the outcome to be commercially so you might call that a used case in sort of traditional terms and go yeah well this is the use case so i don't i don't know what it might be gone for you it might I don't know it might be I'm guessing here that fit members engage um, more than they did last year so that you can drive up renewal rates I, I don't know but yeah I think I think our starting point is probably sign probably sign up and before we start com converting them so we're changing the yeah. way that we we're, we're go obviously going behind the, the step of paywall and we're changing the way that we that we sort of operate and we've also got this situation where uh, which is a very nice problem to have we've suddenly got huge amounts of data from this event that we've run you know this is this is a, this is session 77 I think you know and we've and we've got we've managed to attract a whole load of people that probably didn't know they were members, maybe didn't even know what fit was, but they're engaging with us on a, on a regular basis. So, you know, we've got a, it's quite important for us to jump quite quickly. So I, so I would, I would imagine, and that, you know, it's a, it, it'd be a group decision and, and, uh, but I'd imagine that first thing will be to try and convert them into some sort of regular interaction. Mm. Well, it well, will that, be. That, that, that would be a classic hypothesis, wouldn't it? So you, yeah. you would say, okay, if people uh, attended a lot of our sessions over the last, you know, so many weeks, um, does that mean that they're likely to attend next year or something in the middle or whatever it might be, the hypotheses? And then you can, you can then start to break potentially your users into cohorts. And you might find that people that have attended three or four sessions are equally likely to engage with the people who've attended all 70, right? You'd, you'd find off the, the cutoff point, as it were, in your cohorts. And that, that would allow you to focus on what behaviours you'd like to drive. So you start with the hypotheses, look at the data to see how you'd measure it, um, and then with your small team, um, create communications that are designed to encourage the behaviours that you're looking to accumulate amongst your user base. Yeah, I think I think the experience of of, of running this this event and the, the audience levels that you know are way beyond our expectations have sort of shaped or starting to shape what we're going to do next anyway i think but it's sort of it just feels listening to you two guys with with the levels of experience it does feel a tiny bit daunting but i know that james will hold our hands through the through the process um but um no that's just that's just one for me really but i've got some i've got some um questions from the audience um not particularly pointed at anybody unless it says but it says when constructing your paywalls do you consider this is a this is a very similar question to one that came up earlier about micropayments actually 
Do you consider how much money individuals will spend on content? Is there an upper limit? And what is that? Is it 30 pounds a month? Is it more? Is it less? Now, I'm sure that like the conversation we had earlier this morning, that's, that's based around product and value and whether it's news or whether it's specific. But I mean, do you, do you have that sort of measure when you, talk, when you look at LTV? I mean, you must do, I guess, with the, with, when setting marketing budgets of how much you want to invest acquiring that, that consumer. Yeah, we, we do um, quite a lot of work on before we launch paywalls or launch products on pricing because pricing, you know, it's obviously a very central tenant of lifetime value and oddly enough, often overlooked, almost like, oh, what does everyone else charge? Let's do something slightly more, slightly less, sort of around that. Um, so one of, one of the things I'd recommend you do is, is something called conjoin analysis, which is taking the different elements of your product and trying to work out what those different elements of your product proposition are worth to the audience. Um, and you can do that through research. I, I do quite a lot of research on that. You get your pricing right at the beginning. So you've got a good balance between value and price that will serve you very well over time. If you set the price too low at the beginning, it can be extremely hard to push the price up to the value you're delivering um, because you've already set price expectations. So uh, it's a really good question. Actually, a really, in my experience, it's a question that isn't asked enough. You know, what should we charge for this? And, and the, the answer, as far as it might be, is what, what is it worth to your audience? Not what your competitors charging, or is, what is it worth to your audience? And to find that out, you have to ask them. Um, and you have to put propositions in front of them. Yeah, I mean, again, sorry not to talk about fit the whole time, but, but going back to going through this process with, with James and, and Scott that we're about to embark on, that's been a really, really difficult question for us around a virtual event. And, uh, you know, I don't know what Debs thinks about that. I know that they have much, you know, yours, yours is very intellectual, and obviously scientific, so you've got a different type of audience. But, you know, for us to sort of try and find price points was quite tricky. And, and I think to some extent we were sort of, you know, looking at what other people did and trying to work out what that value proposition was. And, and strangely, the outcome of the way that we generated revenue was completely different from the way that we thought it was going to be. Um, but I, 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 that was possibly a bit more luck than judgment uh, because we were, you know, we'd never done it before. And so we didn't know what we didn't know. I think, you, you, you know, it's a common thing, right? You learn as you go. So, you know, 12 months ago, new scientists didn't do virtual events. Um, we probably <coughs> thought about it and we didn't think, you know, it just, it just, it didn't move for whatever reason. Um, you know, the circumstances of, of COVID almost pushed us down that route. Um, and we did take a quick kind of learning approach, um, you know, looking at what the pricing could be, uh, surveying some of our audience to see, you know, the price point, the value that they would put on the product. We ran a, a free test event to get the learnings from it. And um, that was, you know, to learn the tech, the process, um, and really just to test the water. And then we pivoted to a paid model. Um, and we continue, you know, we, we, we pour over the data from each event every time. Um, you know, we hadn't even conceived to do that as a product at this time last year. Actually, weirdly, you know, it's given us really a, like a great avenue to now go down because if physical events return, we probably will keep virtual events because guess what? You get a more global audience. Um, which is fantastic. We just, that hadn't been moving before. So um, I think you, you test, you learn each time. Um, we are definitely doing the same. Keep it simple, be really clear on the outcomes. To Julian's point, you know, really use data um, to inform how it's going. Um, you know, and you will keep learning. We are still refining those virtual events and we will continue to do so to make them you know, as good as we can for the customers. John, John, just as a, on the outside here, not in the, uh, I'm not a publisher, but I do have a subscription-based business model. And I think one of the things that we find all the way through our customers, we try and talk about this a lot to our customers, is you've got to start with understanding who people are. So, yeah. you know, it's earlier talking about this flywheel effect, of succession of tests. One test can get a flywheel on the next. But if you don't know who people are, you get you know one. So I think your first hypothesis is right. And I think, you know, interesting the, the, the question that you had from the audience is interesting because you can't really do that testing if you don't know if you're testing the same person. Now you've got to get people logged in and you have to get them in lots of sessions logged in so that you know when James comes back and he's on his mobile versus iPad versus desktop, um, it's the same person. 
and therefore you have a more complete picture for your data. So um, I think people need to think about that. There are there are things that will drive the, the revenue, but you have to be looking at driving your data footprint as well. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Just, just one. Uh, okay. Point. Sorry, go on. Yeah, just a really quick point, John, on price. <clears throat> so the, the value that people extract from your products can change in two ways. One, you either add value in, so you do something, adds value or something external happens that adds value. And you can track that. We found, I'll give you a practical example of the latter. One of our magazines is The Week, a uh, magazine in, in the US. We track the MPS score, the Net Promoter score. It, it's gone up significantly over the last year uh, and the product hasn't changed. That's one of the virtues of that particular product. It's been stable for ages. So the product hasn't changed. All that's happened is the value that that product brings has gone up considerably of the dominance of fake news in the states so that external factor has meant that good trusted sources of media their value's gone up it gives us pricing power so it enables us to say okay the value of our product has gone up what do we do with our price so yeah sure we can see that we, we run the um, we run the subs report with, with center one and you can have that you can see that um that change with New York Times etc although that's probably changed a little bit with Trump's comments today um so um are any of the panel using AI ML tools to determine lifetime value, LTV? I'll answer that really quickly. No, we are not. I'm not, even, I'm not even sure I understand the question, which is probably my problem, but anyway. <laughs> if anybody is, it's probably Julian. <laughs> I think, no, the, the, the answer to that is no, uh, but we've got ambitions. So I, I always think, you know, we, we spend quite a lot of money on the social media platform, but they're all using ML and AI to, auto, to automate and uh, optimize how, how they deliver our marketing messages to their audiences. And then when those audiences come into our infrastructure, we're, without being rude about it, we're literally manually creating journeys. Um, but to, to my mind, uh, you need to manually create journeys to understand the impact. And then over time, introduce basic machine learning and then potentially AI as long as people understand the principles behind that otherwise it's the black box thing it's like I don't trust this thing what's it doing yeah you need to build that test and learn culture within your business and you do that manually until you slowly evolve or quite rapidly into machine learning in the first instance and AI in the second instance so we're not there yet and that, there's well, I, well, that answers no my question which is in that area we certainly won't be, and we will be, as I said, being held uh, by the hand very gently into this process, I think, as we, uh, as we convert across. Um, so it says, I've got another question for the audience. So how many companies using virtual, how, how are the companies using virtual events? Can they be a lead into subscriptions? I think you've sort of partly answered this. Or are they solely uh, subscriber benefits? So Debs, you talked about having, a, having a, as I understood it, a model where subscriber because uh, uh, subscribers were able to come free but everybody else had to, to had to pay on demand is that correct i think i've lost you yeah sorry my uh, video has just gone off but hopefully, all right. you can, hopefully you can hear me yeah um, i can hear you fine so our, our virtual events have been paid for events the ones that we've uh, ran since the end of april and they are very you know they're topic focused um around a specific thing you know how the brain works something like that or yeah. evolution. Um, our um, subscriber only event is a added value to a subscription, but we don't charge for that. So if you're a subscriber, um, you can come to our, uh, we called it an all stars event, but basically a subscriber only event will get you free access to that virtual event. Um, and we did, um, we did one last week. It was great. It was our editor and a couple of our um, key reporters really talking around the challenges of reporting COVID, but we did a big Q&A um, and we had, I can't remember the exact number, but I think our editor nearly went into a meltdown because we had over 560 questions come in during that session. So, um, you know, they were, let's just say our subscribers were very engaged in that event. What, so we will your... do more. Wasn't one of your topics recently when the universe will end or something, which was a bit deep, I thought, looking at it. I, you had, uh, we, you had we thousands have, of people we, on that. <laughs> we have a range of content. Some of it is really deep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. 
Okay, um, I've just got one last question here. What innovations, this is to James, uh, and again, with a, from a selfish point of view, I'm sure we all want to know this, but what innovations are coming to paywalls in the future? Uh, um, so, well, for us, a paywall is just an outcome. It's just a thing. Yeah. So, um, look, there are products that are marketing themselves as paywalls. That's normally what we do. But we can, of course, deliver a paywall. Um, for us, we've got a big release coming soon. Um, it's been, well, we've spent a lot of venture money on that. Um, but it's a, it's a very big release, which is very, very much focused around orchestrating customer journeys. Now, um, for us, there are lots, of, in fact, n number of, of, of different types of outcomes you can create on a customer journey. So this is a tool that allows you to map those journeys, about to trigger different things, you know, someone's on an exit journey, what can you do, can you offer them a different proposition, that sort of thing. So a full journey kind of orchestration tool, um, big releases coming for us later in the year. Um, I did want to step in earlier around the ML stuff, uh, ML AI, but of course that is something that we do. Um, and we do apply things like machine learning, we're actually reinforcement learning. Um, along a, a customer journey. The big release for us um, in that direction is not just um, using intelligence to make better decisions along the customer journey, but also to be able to provide a more dynamic product proposition so that you can actually customize the product around the individual rather than just offering the same three products every time. So um, there's a, a lot happening. We've had a huge investment in R&D in the last um, six months and continue to uh, invest very heavily. So lots of exciting stuff. Well, I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure that's uh, tech that we will all use with time uh, once, we, once we get our stuff together. Look, guys, we are out of time. Uh, thank you ever so much. That's really interesting, um, particularly interesting for us. I'm sure extremely interesting for the audience as well. Um, James, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Zephyr.com and Zephyr.com. Okay, and if you, if, if, uh, if you forget that or struggle uh, to remember that, not, we'll put that in the chat box, but also you can get hold of me if you want, and I can make an introduction. That's john, J-O-H-N, at fit.com, or you can come through to info uh, at fit.com. Uh, just very, very quickly, I'd just like to talk about talking about virtual events. So tomorrow morning at 9.30, the migration to virtual events, how publishers can pivot to virtual and still deliver quality, a, a quality event experience. So that's 9.30 tomorrow morning. This is the last of our sessions today. I'd just like to thank everyone once again for your time and your insight and sharing all the, all the things that you have shared with us. It's really been very, very valuable. Thanks again, guys.